wanted freedom, adjust the frames, got keys to kingdom, unlock the chains, so but a podcast, open up your brains, so but a podcast, let's get it man. Yeah. Welcome back to another episode of Sober the Podcast with your host Bradley Saxon, Christopher Carlton. Yo. And we got a guest in the house today. In the laboratory today. Mr. Sanford and Sons himself. <laughs> Michael Osborne. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Michael Patterson. Come on, give it up for Michael Patterson. Hey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mike, what's up, man? Not much. Just hanging out. Just hanging, hanging out? Yep. I don't know why I said Mike Osborne. Shout out to Mike Osborne. <laughs> he He's actually in recovery, but he was one of my like youth pastors growing up. What's your full name, Mike? David Michael Patterson. Michael David Patterson? David Michael. David Michael Patterson. Mm -hmm. Well, David Michael Patterson, welcome to Sober the Podcast. I'm glad to have you on here. You didn't have to go too far today to travel, did you? No, I did not. Down the steps. I see it. Yeah, so Mike's uh, actually one of our trusted servants here at the Bridge Center. He's the best trusted servant I, I think we've ever had. Yeah. Not not no uh, shade thrown on no those that came before yeah. him. Um, <clears throat> but he's done a very good job at um, stewarding the season that God's put him in. But mm -hmm. the truth is, is it, it life hasn't always been the way it has been over the last year. That's correct. You've been in some some pretty tougher situations, right? Yes, yes sir. And we're going to get to that. But before we do get to your story of how God's rescued you from uh, a drug addiction, uh, we do a, an icebreaker called the three-pointer. Okay. Have you listened to this over the podcast at all? Uh, a couple of them. Okay, so at the, at the end, we let our guests shoot baskets. You see this basketball gold above your head? Mm -hmm. We let our guests shoot, but the way that they get the opportunity at the end to shoot is that they have to either answer three questions or we play songs and they have to guess who the artist is. Okay. Now, if you don't get any of them right, you don't get to shoot. Uh -huh. But I feel sure that you're going to get all three of them right, okay? Uh -huh. And so today's three picks are going to be songs. I'm going to play them. You'll hear them in your headphones. And all you need to do is let the uh, listeners know who the artist is, okay? All right. Can you do that? I'll try. CJ, you think he can do that? Yeah. Yes, sir, he said. All right, here we go. Number one. One, two, three. Leonard Skinner. Let's go. Come on, Mike. let's go. One for one, baby. Let's go. Mike. One for one. Leonard go, Skinner, Mike. baby. All right. I'm a, it's going to get a little bit harder as we go, okay, Mike? All right. So, you know, just know that. Right. You need to hear a little more? Yeah. Now, don't know why. <laughs> Come on, bro. Think about it. All right, we'll move on to another one. Give you a little second. Come on, brother. Come on, two for three. Two for three. Two for three. We're gonna give him a bonus one since he's got the first. He's gotten two out of three. I'm gonna make this very hard. And I, and I need you to get this right, okay? All right. I don't care what you got to do to get this right. I need you to get this right, okay? Can you. you can you do that for me? I'll try my best. Eminem. <laughs> Who is it? Eminem. Oh yeah, man. You got it. Come on, somebody. Three Mike can go from Leonard Skinner to Almond Brothers to, to Eminem <laughs> to Blackfoot. <laughs> No. All right, Mike. At the end of the show, you'll get a you'll get an opportunity to shoot your shot, okay? Uh -huh. And maybe you can make it and take you home some merchandise. Uh -huh. All right. So, a lot of the way that we frame uh, these episodes as guests come on to share their story of redemption is we talk a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Okay. And uh, so, a lot of times we start with early years in people's lives. Do you remember any of those things? Because I know that was about, what, 75 years ago? Yeah, something like that. Close to it. 75? Close to it. You almost 75? Mm, I'm, I'll be 62 next <laughs> So can you somehow go back into your 
had a tricks to uh, being a young, being, you know, a younger fella and what that was like? Well, uh, my home life, you know, it was uh, it was real chaotic, a lot of alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, and I just grew up uh, not really, you know, just wondering, you know, why I wasn't as, in, as important as I thought I should be, why, you know, they didn't have time to, you know, spend with me instead of drinking or drugging or whatever. And it just kind of left me a little insecure, a little... Uh, uh, you know, things like that. What do you think were the first things that you started doing that helped you with that void? Uh, I started smoking marijuana when I was about 11 years old, mm. you know, and I, and I realized... How'd that, you get a hold of marijuana? Uh, some neighborhood kids. Okay, so y'all, older, all y'all older. didn't have no parents, and y'all were out... Oh, we had parents. They were just... Um, I, would just, I knew you had parents, but I'm uh, saying like they were they were preoccupied. Yeah, they were very. My mother was preoccupied with chasing my dad down, you know, hunting, you know, going to bars and stuff, and trying to make that work. And uh, you know, it just uh, just left kinda, you some time, yeah, to do some things that yeah. you probably shouldn't have been doing. And so, you know, I I noticed some older teenage kids uh, in our neighborhood. You know, they were getting high, smoking pot, and stuff like that, and. And uh, so I, I tried it, you know, and I, I automatically realized, you know, that I, I could socialize, talk, you know, uh, make people laugh and stuff like that where I couldn't. Just, Prior to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, with the marijuana, like, is that something that you, I mean, obviously you recreationally do that in the beginning because you can't really get it mm-hmm. a lot, but you're doing it as, as opportunities arise. Well, the marijuana was pretty accessible. I mean, uh, like I said, the, the older kids in my neighborhood, you know, they, uh, you know, they when you were, say older, you're 11 or 12 and they're like they're about 14, 15, yeah. you know, and marijuana, you know, in my in the area that I grew up in, it was, you know, it's about every other house. Was that the Appleton Mill Hill? No, Homeland Park. Yeah. Homeland Park. Mm-hmm. Jerry Drive? No. Uh, you didn't uh, live on Jerry Drive? Uh, I lived on a road called Burson Road. Yeah. And and, uh, and so, it, you know, marijuana was a very accessible drug at that, at that time and, and uh, didn't have to hunt for it too much, you know. You loved it? Yeah. I mean, since you the first time you smoked it, you was like, I love this. Oh, yeah. You got high? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But back then, it was just swag, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Full of seeds? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I mean, it was some, you know, it was good marijuana, but it was, it was different than it is today. Yeah, for sure. How was school for you? What was school like? Uh, I did good in school um, when I wanted to or, you know, when I... I, I had the I had the ability to make good grades, yeah. you know, and all that. I just didn't. Once I started getting high, I just uh, I let all that go because I mean, me being uh, accepted by kids and uh, friends and stuff like that, you know, that was more important to me than than school. And and uh, my parents, they didn't seem to care anything about what I was doing in school, you know. And I'm not trying to I'm not trying to put my parents down or anything. You know, my dad he was an alcoholic and a drug addict, and uh, but uh, you know, it just wasn't their priority. It just wasn't their. And priority. and here's the truth: we tell our story. We all do. And I've said it before on my story. We're we're never sharing our story to belittle our folks. We love them. We honor them. But we are trying to reach people that are where we are or where we were. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times we do that with vulnerability, sharing our past for mm-hmm. other people to relate so that they understand they're not unique and they're not in a situation where other people have never been. Mm-hmm. And that's the purpose of this podcast is to reach into these crevices to bring hope to people mm-hmm. for them to realize like, yeah, we know what you feel like. We've been through that. Yeah. And it's a hopeless feeling, but there is hope in that mm-hmm. we have overcome some of these different things. And the truth is, is you're and my story are a lot alike, man. Mm-hmm. The truth is, my mother, she was just as addicted to my father as he was any drug, you know. Yeah. And it, and it just took, it just, it just kind of thinned out the family even more, you know, because she was so focused on, she might as well have been on drugs or alcohol herself. For sure. You know, so. Well, she was codependent on him. Mm. And that's what happens when you get in those relationships where you can't control other people, man. They control you. 
you chase them and mm-hmm. try to make them, you know, mm-hmm. it's a never ending job too, just like chasing drugs is. Right. Did you have any brothers and sisters? Yeah, I got a younger brother and a younger sister. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So you're the oldest? Yes, I am. Okay. Did any of them two struggle with drugs and alcohol? Um, well, uh, no, my brother, he, he went to live with my grandparents when he was about 11. And so he kind of, uh, escaped that or avoided that, you know, and, uh, my sister, she's, she's still addicted. Sure. Well, it's amazing, man. A lot of people don't understand that our environments play a, 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 a big role in shaping mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's like I shared this morning in class, man, there's things as an adult that I've had to investigate to find out why I do it. Mm-hmm. And I do it because there's been some things in my life that sent me messages and subconsciously I believed lies. You know what I'm saying? That in my adulthood has created actions. I don't even know where they come from. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's probably safe to say that you're you've experienced the same type of trauma that we have. Yeah. Cuz it don't take a good household or a bad household. Obviously you don't want kids being raised by drug addicts that are are using, mm-hmm. but like there are people who have a home life that looks good, but what there's no God, there's no leadership of the Holy Spirit in the father's home that's leading the family, then kids can still also pick up lies you know what i'm saying and that type of environment too you know what i mean so i think that wow you know ours was just blatantly wrong there's some people that grew up in a well-meaning home that did their best but Mm -hmm. still allowed situations to afford them knowledge that wasn't accurate either that's right you know what i'm saying because i've always said that we didn't have the money to hide our addiction but money does a, a good job at hiding things that people struggle with that we do. They just don't, they just have the means to cover it up. Mm-hmm. Right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because we realize as we study the Bible that self sufficiency can actually produce good looking fruit or at least sociably or, or, or it's accepted by society. Like yeah. workaholism is a fruit of self-sufficiency, mm-hmm. but most people want their daughters to date a man that works hard. Right. Well, here's the truth. If workaholism is where he worships to find meaning, do you really want your daughter to find somebody who has good looking fruit, but don't know Jesus? That's right. You know what I'm saying? And a man uses drugs because he's self-sufficient. He's mismanaged his life. He has wounds and he drinks to fix the wounds of his mismanagement. Mm -hmm. But both are rooted in Mm self-sufficiency. You know what I'm saying? There's a good looking fruit and there's a blatantly evil looking fruit, right? But we have to find out what the root of this stuff is, right? right? And so we just are the kind of people that have had what I like to call, um, what, what, what was it that we learned, CJ, in discipleship class that was called ugly-looking flesh? Yeah. It, it, that ain't the word they used. It though. wasn't. It was... Uh, Negative program flesh. Yeah, that's it. And then you have positive program flesh. Yeah. We are not in, I don't think, the category, CJ's more than you and I, in the positive looking flesh, like to where we project an image that looks good to society, mm-hmm. but inwardly we're running the show. Yeah. Like we come from, you know, blatantly. Yeah. Just, <laughs> we ain't hide none of it. We selfish. You know what I mean? You, can you identify with that, Mike? I think the listeners, uh, as they hear that, can identify that, you know, and, and the understanding of why the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You can't live your way out of sin. That's right. right. You have to be born again mm-hmm. because we've created such a mess that we need the power of God to be metamorphosized. Yeah. Is that a word? It is now. It is now. It's mm-hmm. like the Power Rangers. Go, go, mm-hmm. Power Ranger. Mm-hmm. It's morphing time. <sighs> no. You know what I'm talking about? We got to be transformed. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right. And yes, so sir. um, you're just talking about things that probably followed your life until... Probably even, you still probably struggle with some of the things so, then now. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yes, sir. I'm more aware of uh, a lot of that today than I was a year or so ago, 14 months ago when I came here, you know. But, uh, uh, but all my life I've struggled, you know, struggled with that. So uh, I just know I've got a, a way that I can uh, work through all that today. Well, I, I didn't in the past. Yeah, yeah, so tell us. So as you grow up, you're smoking weed at 11. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you finish school? No. 
Okay, no finish. I I've got a I've got a GED. So I'm, you I'm you you went back and got your GED, but what what how old were you when you quit high school, or did uh, you make it high school? No, I quit in the eighth grade. What school was you going to? Lakeside, Southwood, Southwood. Mm -hmm. So you quit school, um, how eighth grade? So what, thirteen, fourteen? Well, I I had uh, missed a couple of grades, so you know I was about fourteen years old or so in the eighth grade, and uh, and just being totally honest with you, I, I had become involved with this uh, girl that was a little older than me, and and uh, she got pregnant, and so um, we just kind of lived together until I got sixteen, and we got married, and. Uh, uh, was you living on your own? Was you out on your own at this point? Uh, I wasn't. I, I did. When I turned 16, I got a job in a textile mill and uh, and was able to live on my own somewhat. Yeah. You know, where, it, so, so were you still, uh, I mean, obviously probably still smoking weed, but oh yeah. had it accelerated to, to anything else? Well, by the time I was 15 or 16, I had started using methamphetamines and cocaine, uh, you know. And Was it every day at that point? Not every day. No, it wasn't every day. Um, but, you know, it, but, you know, all that didn't last long. I got, uh, I got in trouble when I was 18. I went to prison. Uh, Drug related? Uh, no. Well, I was high one night and I, I robbed the convenience store. And uh, so I went to prison for that. What'd you get? As far as money, oh, you got money. Yeah, you was robbing for money. Well, I mean, not I, for a slim gym. No, I just went in and robbed them. You know, just, but anyway, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, no trouble, man. Stick it up. And uh, so I spent five years in prison. Mm. And How much of that did you serve? Uh, four, four years and nine months. What prison? I was at Perry. I was at Givens and at Manning. Mm. Perry Correctional. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that stint in prison. I mean, what does that do to us? Mm -hmm. I mean, how old are you, 18, 19? I mean, what does a prison sentence at 18, 19, five years do to a mind? Well, when I came out, uh, you know, I really wasn't aware of what it was doing to my mind while I was in there. I was just living day to day, just, you know, trying to, to make it through day to day. But when I when I completed that and came back out, uh, you know, I realized – uh, I can look back now and see the attitude that I had. You know, it was a, I got to get all that back, you know, and the world owed me. And, you know, I was tired of being, you know, what, you know, just treated any kind of way. And I was going, I had a, I'm going to get it back attitude, you mm -hmm. know. And so uh, for the next 20, 30 years, you know, I, I that's how I, you lived. That was my attitude, you know. Uh, now, there was a there was a, a ten year period where me and my wife we were both clean, you know, and uh, but we were just clean. We were now the girl you're talking about living with that got pregnant. You moved in with. You're not talking about your present wife. No, uh, no, it's, uh, my son, my oldest son's mother, Chris. Mm -hmm. And so when you went to prison, she was left to raise him. Yeah. Or or did she? Yeah, she raised. Him. She raised him. Mm -hmm. Is she living? No, she passed away last February. Mm. Now, is Chris the only child that you two have? The only child that me and her had, yeah. Okay, so did she stick with you through the time you were in prison? or No. Uh, that was pretty much over really, by then? Really, uh, Chris was about eight months old. We we separated, you know, and and so, I mean, we we would see each other from time to time, but we, we weren't really together very long, you know. Yeah. Uh, can I just say something? And I know you're vulnerable and humble enough to to express this, including in my life. But isn't it amazing how the things that created the environment for me, I also created for my kids? Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how that curse or that generational problem doesn't stop with time. Yeah. Because your boy just graduated from the Brit Center this weekend. Yes, he did. How about that? Did, he just celebrated a year with you. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's crazy how, well, 
what we are talking about is this generational curse of sin that continues through the bloodline and don't really ever get interrupted unless a man find God That's right. and start to live and train children up in the way that they should go. And your story is one of those of daddy didn't pass on to me what he didn't have. I didn't pass on to my kids what I didn't have. Right. That's exactly right. And it just sort of continues because we don't know and we don't understand and all the foundations of the world are unstable. It's what Psalms 82, four and five says that we have to, uh, we, we need to know God. We need to understand his principles and we need to apply them so that we can live on an unshakable foundation and pass that on to our kids. Right. That's exactly right. Well, I, I guess I just, as I listen to this, it just really helps me to understand the goodness of God because, yeah. um, for all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God, yeah. right? And mm-hmm. while we're able to, by His grace, now reconstruct some of the years the locusts have ate, there's grace for people who are in the same situation as you were, I was, CJ was, to where we've messed it all up. Mm-hmm. We don't deserve any chance. Nope. We, if we deserve anything, we deserve to be put under jail. Yep, that's right. You know, and and never to see the light of day. But mm-hmm. God, right, yep. comes in like He did you. And intervenes into your life and begins to set up situations that put you into a uh, opportunity to recover from addiction, mm-hmm. be present as a daddy to help. Pe- like, dude, do you see how God has really just invaded your life and begin to make up for the years the locusts have ate? Yes, sir. I so do. it's never too late, right? Mm-mm. No, I'm I'm very aware of that today too. You know, uh, a couple of years ago, you know, my part of my mindset was. Uh, you know, my age, you know, I'm getting in my sixties now and, uh, and, you know, uh, you know, I said, well, that's just, that's something that's my time's passed with that, you know, but today that's not, that's not true. You know, you have purpose. Yeah. I have purpose today. And Mm -hmm. I I shared in a meeting last night, uh, about that, you know, that was kind of the, the meditation for that meet for yesterday's meeting. And, uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I couldn't be trusted with anything, uh, didn't feel worthy. I didn't have any purpose, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I just, uh, I shared that, uh, that today, you know, uh, being a house manager here at the bridge, you know, that I'm trusted with all kinds of things. And it's, and it's just, uh, it's just a great feeling to be able to, to know that and be aware of that today. Well, and it just shows you, man, that, you know, whenever we're willing to let God get in our boat and humble ourselves and take instruction how he can start to restore our life from the inside out you know things i didn't learn because i didn't have a daddy things i didn't learn because of this or that like when he becomes my heavenly father he begins like david said to lead me by still waters right make me lie down in green pastures like Mm -hmm. he restores my soul Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm Right, and that's been your experience is mm-hmm. when you finally turned over the shepherd role and let him be your shepherd, that's you're right. starting to learn that I, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Mm-hmm. That's right. That if you stay close to him, he performs. Uh, if you stay close to him and do the best you can, we're performing his work well. He provides what you need. Mm-hmm. And he's got a plan. That's right. He's got a plan for our lives. So you're 20, you're 24, getting out of prison, mm-hmm. right? Uh-huh. What what those next few me years? against the world? Yeah, that's the attitude. Well, that's what I think about outlaw, did, outlaw. You uh, don't know nothing about that. But did, did you drink and use <clears throat> when you were in prison? Uh, a little bit. I was too. I was more concerned about getting out. Yeah, you know. So I mean, I did smoke a little weed here and there. Yeah. Um, I didn't drink at all. Um, but uh. But I did smoke some marijuana and stuff. But I was I was more focused on getting keeping good behavior so that yeah. you could get yeah. out. Yeah. 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 So so you get out. You're 24, and um, you jump back out into the world. What those next few years look like? Well, um, I got I got married again just about immediately out of getting out. Uh, that didn't last very long. I got married again. Uh, I lived in Spartanburg for about seven or eight years, and. Um, you know, just went through a couple of different uh, women's lives, like a like like you say, like, like a, a tornado, like a tornado, just just consuming everything I could, you know, mm-hmm. and not not really caring or anything. Yeah. Well, because where purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. Yeah. 
And so we've adopted this mindset of through human wisdom of what brings us happiness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when it, when I'm, when I is the central fact of my life, everything else is in my peripheral yeah. or in my story to be placed where I need it to be placed. Yeah. And in, in that type of design, people become hostages to yeah. our addiction. Yeah. It is what it is, you know, mm -hmm. like it ain't right. But again, we go right back to when we can humble ourselves and ask God for help. Mm -hmm. One of the things he does is he forgives us of all those sins. Yeah. And he wipes that slate clean. Mm. I mean, that's pretty profound. That's good news. I mean, that's great news. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? There's people right now that don't like us. Yeah. That's right. Because they can't get over what we've been through. Mm -hmm. I'm glad God. Yeah. Ain't that way. Yeah. That's exactly and right. where these people have whatever right to be the way they are, I'm thankful that their opinion of me is not got the final say. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful for an all loving God, right? Yeah. Yeah. That has stepped in and intervened and he's <laughs> he's he's forgiven me some of the most inexcusable things in life. Yeah. You know, and he's afforded me this this new journey. Mm -hmm. You know, that I mean I don't I've know, man. I've got kids, you know, that that uh won't you know, they won't talk to me got family members that won't talk to me, you know, to this very day. And I'm okay with that today because I know God's got a plan for all that. And I just, uh, I know that he, uh, that I just got to stick with what's been going on in my life the last 14 months. And uh, God's going to work all that out in his time. I can't, you know, uh, you don't, you don't fix it if it's not broke. And that's just, you know, I don't, you know, that's just the way I look at things today, you know. Well, it just, I mean, it, it goes to this idea of recovery is also about building character. Mm -hmm. And it is the reality that forgiveness has barriers. And so as God has forgiven us, we learn to forgive others. But we have to also understand that some of the things we've done to others is not just a fingernail scratch. Mm -hmm. It's a broken bone. That's right. And so we have to give them equally as much time as God's given us to That's heal. Right. You know, because trust is lost in gallons. That's right. It's earned in droplets. Mm -hmm. And so many of us have to understand that forgiveness is not reconciliation because if we were waiting for the person to accept our forgiveness, we wouldn't have no joy in the journey. Yeah. And so I'm thankful that God didn't put our joy in other people's hands right. because if my joy was dictated by you getting over what I've done, I'd have, I, <laughs> I would be in big trouble, you know, yeah. so... That's the, the good news about forgiveness is that when we receive what Jesus has done for us and we live out of that place, that we're able to understand these things from different outlooks to realize people need time to heal, mm -hmm. and it ain't personal. Yeah. They've got to figure it out, you know? Yeah. I just want to, you know, uh, I've been, I hadn't really spoke about this too much, but um, a couple of weeks ago, Suge came to me and told me one morning, you know, that uh, he appreciated everything that I'd done around here and that, that it was it didn't go unnoticed, you know, and it just set a, a, a train of thought off in my mind, you know, that uh, that felt great to hear him tell me that, you know, but I didn't have to hear it today. Mm. And, you know, I spent most of my life needing need, somebody needing to, to hear praise that, you, mm. needing to hear that. And I don't, you know, I'm not there today. I mean, I, I'm good with, uh, uh, I know that. I know that God accepts me. I know that uh, I have a purpose. And uh, I know that I'm needed and wanted, you know, and uh, and I'm just very thankful for that today. And yeah. that speaks to the power of God, man. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and just think, man, and and I've been studying something, and, and you can look more into this, but, like, you know, man is the glory of God, right? We came mm -hmm. from God, right. woman out of us. <clears throat> but if you look up in... If you look up this idea of what God was creating concerning man, like there's this translation to the word ob that Adam translated to, which really meant source or upholder, which is so similar to Abba because that's what God is referred to, Abba Father, and how he is a source that withholds us. The Bible says that he holds us up with his righteous right hand. But when you're in the purpose of what God created you to do, a lot of times you will be the upholder of things and never get praise for it. Mm. 
And so you just got, it's like leaving this room and these beams that are holding the ceiling in place, keeping us alive. When I leave, I'm not like, thank you, beams. Mm -hmm. I appreciate y'all holding this place up, right? Mm -hmm. It just does it because it's its purpose. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when you get in purpose with God and following him, you're going to be able to be an upholder of things, mm -hmm. even though the thing don't come back and say thank you. Because, mm -hmm. right. I mean, how many times has God pulled us out and we've just re we've refused to go back and say, God, thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. I imagine, or, or I'm thankful that he didn't quit doing it just because I didn't praise him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but now, obviously, when you get in tune with him, you praise him for what he does, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of times as a man, especially as we uphold things in our home with our kids, there's a lot of things that 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 we take pressure of that we work through, but we don't always get that praise. But we do it because it's who we are and what yeah. we were created to do. That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. And that's what I thought about after you said, I don't need that today. Mm-hmm. You know, number one, you don't need it today because your father in heaven affirms that identity in you through his spirit. That's yeah. Right. And you're not doing it for them anymore. You're doing it for him. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's right. And that affirmation and that relationship with you with him personally affords you what to affords you to know what to do. Yeah. It's been done for me. And you know, and so I just want to give that back. You know, I mean, uh and it's just a great feeling to be able to to help these guys. Some of the guys around here that you know I talk to from day to day, sometime and uh, you know, sometimes when I'm saying something, I can't even believe it's me saying it. You know, and I know it's not coming from me; it's coming mm -hmm. from God. You know, and uh, it just it makes me very grateful. Well, and I do think there's a you know while we don't need it, I think in situations, especially marriages, I think it's good for the woman to find the man doing something right and praise him. Yeah, because if we are a reflection of God, mm -hmm. whom says that I will inhabit the praises of His people? Yeah, mm -hmm. a God that is male, he, he's you know maleness. We're created in His image. This maleness idea of being like our daddy mm -hmm. that. Uh, is that there's something that praise will do for us. Yeah. Not that we need it, yeah. but you let your wife catch you doing something good and praise you, mm -hmm. especially give you affirmation in front of your peers, mm -hmm. you're going to feel like you the Hulk. Yeah, That's right. You're going to turn into this big green monster, mm -hmm. rip your clothes mm -hmm. off, and you're going to freaking feel like you could tote the world. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think there's something in that design when it comes to wife and husband. Yeah. That when it's in order, mm -hmm. there's a praise that comes mm. that you don't need, but that it's almost like fuel for whatever God's called you to do. Mm -hmm. right. You know what I'm saying? Right. <clears throat> I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, I mean, we now we're now we're on the subject of talking about praising God. We can equally as we can equally praise God as much for uh, what we see, which I think what we see is just the uh, probably one of the smallest portions of what he's kept from hitting us when we uh, deserve yeah. for it to hit us. So like I pray, like most of the time we praise God for what he's done, you know, in the American culture we live in now, we praise God for a new car. We praise God for, you know, uh, this or that. But, you know, sometimes I sit back and I'm just praising God for what my life didn't turn out to be, you know, <laughs> or like what, what, what should have hit my yeah. life, but he blocked from hitting. Like it. I praise God for that car wreck that, that didn't take my life. Or I praise God for that overdose that didn't take my life. Or I praise God. So like, and even, <clears throat> even in, uh, in, in Hebrew, the word, uh, Hallel, uh, which is hallelujah. It means to praise. Hallel means to praise. And then you have the word, um, Yashab, which is, uh, which is to dwell or to sit in, right? And then you have the word, uh, you have the word Shabbat, which means to worship, right? Which means to bow down. And so we have all these opportunities to praise God. When we praise God, He dwells with us. We create this house. You say it all the time. We create this house mm -hmm. for God to come sit in and dwell with us, right? It, it actually means to lock in. That word yeshab means to lock in. So God, when we praise him, he comes in our situation, and that praise causes him to dwell 
within us, mostly, especially in recovery, we talk about the group conscious. He comes mm-hmm. down in the group conscious and he dwells within that. And then we worship him or we bow down to a God. And man, I'm going to tell you right now, my life in uh, addiction was the opposite of that antithesis of that. I praise myself, right? N- nothing dwells within me but selfishness mm. and sin. And I worship myself for the things that I think I've done. And the walk with my walk with God, your walk with God, his walk with God in recovery is the the antithesis to that, which is I praise God. He dwells with us. He helps us. He comforts us. He loves us. He encourages us from the inside out, not from the outside in, from the inside because he lives in us. And then we worship him and we bow down to him. I'm going to tell you right now, me, me seven years ago, I'm not bowing down to nobody. Mm. No, that was, that was my, uh, the attitude I had when I was talking about coming out of prison, you know, I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't bowing down to anybody or, any, you know, I, I felt like I'd been doing that my entire life, you know, and, and, uh, but I'm, you know, today though, I'm thankful for, um, uh, some of that stuff that I had to go through. It's made me what I am right now today, you know. And um, and that's things that I've learned here since I've been here in the last 14 months of my life, you know. I've never learned, you know, I've never never cared about any uh, of that or or wasn't aware of it in the past, you know. And, but that's things that I've learned from, from uh, you and CJ and, and the people who come here and volunteer, you know. Yeah. Well, the, the the arrow that we shoot out every day, man, for me, like what gets me excited is respecting other people, like honoring other mm-hmm. people. Like when somebody asks me to do something, yes, sir. Just being grateful and creating an atmosphere within my own heart mm. to be thankful that I'm actually a part of something mm. when I shouldn't be and when not too long ago nobody wanted me to be around. And, and for a matter of fact, I didn't really even want to be around myself. That's why I drank exactly in you right. so much. Like, I don't even like me. Mm. How can it, how could I expect anybody else to like me when I don't like me? Yeah. You know? And so <clears throat> it's just really exciting to see. Um, I don't know if this we can go in depth enough in this in this podcast, but it's exciting to me to see that you have the heart to serve. But you serve in such a way, man, that has humility just dripping off of it. And it's so unique. And you can tell when when same spirit no same spirit, no same spirit, you can tell that what you do is genuine. Mm. It's authentic. It's not, you're not trying to create some angle. Like I was an angle guy. Yeah, I was I, Like I was, I was always trying to create an angle for something. <laughs> if I do this, I'll get that. If, if I, if I'm nice to them, they'll be nice to me. If, if I help them out here three days later, I'm already trying to borrow $20. You know, right. you know that $20 angle mm-hmm. I was always playing. Man. And, like, life is exhausting like that. And now we're not walking with Jesus. We don't have to create an angle. Right. And and now, now our works are already done through Jesus, and now I'm just trying to enter into the promise of his rest mm-hmm. by not trying to fulfill my own works. Yeah. And, and it's just cool to see, like, you're existing in day in, in today. Mm-hmm. Just being present. He says that all the time, man. Recovery is a gift, and it's the present. It's the present. Well, a lot right of now. people, like the thing that I notice a lot about you and my path, CJ's path, and a lot of guys that continue to evolve into greater people, per se, is those who are accepting their now as a part of that development. Mm. And I see so many people in recovery, man, that that really just, I don't know if they think that, like, they're trying to, you know, get in and get it all back. But, like, when you get in and really surrender your life to God and he moves in, you start to realize that there are seasons that you have to embrace that are going to potentially bring the reality of what you never could have brought on them by yourself anyway. Mm. You know, and so, like, there's a lot of people from the outside looking in that would look at our stories and wonder why we ain't doing this right away, this right away, this right away. But we're on a new basis. Mm-hmm. We're on a basis of trust and line upon God. And he's got me in this season doing certain things because he's preparing me for something that I don't foresee that he knows about mm-hmm. that I'm just being trying to stay in tune with him. That's right. And so like this ain't going to always look like this chapter is just a chapter of the story. Right. I mean, this is right. this is just a, 
a, a time in your story to where God is writing certain chapters, but these are all leading you to greater chapters. And there's, there's something purposeful about every one of them, mm. you know, that's preparing you for greater, mm. you know, uh, duties. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And, 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 you know, I, I would imagine being a husband, being a father, this is all preparing you for those things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, finding people content with little, mm. I think there's much godliness in that because we are people in the flesh that won't want, there's never mm -hmm. enough, but just to be okay with little shows that I've, I've got some, another source in my life other than the flesh. And I can understand my salvation. Yeah. Well, the flesh always wants more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being content is a big, is, is a big thing with me right now. I'm, I'm more, I've never been as content today as I, I've never been content my whole life like I am today. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and uh, I mean, I can say that with 100% honesty. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I go to bed at night and I sleep good. Mm -hmm. uh, I wake up, uh, you know, peaceful. You know, I don't have, I don't have any, uh, mm -hmm. I don't have any over, overwhelming worries or anything like that. You know, I just, uh, uh, I'm just very grateful and thankful mm -hmm. that, that I, you know, I mean, can, Contentment is real big in my life. I just never been able to be at peace and uh, at ease like I am right now. You know, uh, you you say this all the time, B. You say we create the fellowship that we crave. Mm -hmm. What you said is I'm content. It's amazing to me when you stop trying to create rooms for yourself to feel important in that those rooms will show up yeah. and you won't need to feel important in those rooms whenever you get there. Yeah. You'll know in the innermost core of who you are that you're supposed to be there because you didn't create it for you to be there. You allow God to work on you so you can sustain it or whatever that thing is when he puts you in the room. Yeah. In other words, you're not the director of the show anymore. That's right. mm -hmm. You're not trying to create the room, set the stage, get the lights and the ballet all in, all intact. Make sure that that person, that person, that person's doing, you know, what they're supposed to do. Now you're just doing what God would have you do. Isn't it amazing when you're not being directed by a hundred things that you're only being directed by one? Mm -hmm. It's just that's where the peace comes that's from, right. man. Like, I'm not being directed by how people treat me today. I'm being directed by God. I'm, I'm not being directed by whether I feel, imp whether I feel important in, in this situation. I'm being directed by God. And I'm not having to juggle all these things, and I'm only being directed by one, mm -hmm. that one spirit, man. And uh, So you're, like, I know we've, we've been all over, all over the map in, in, this, in, this, in this podcast, but, man, I— there, there's a story that I definitely need you to tell because I think it's extremely powerful for the listener to hear, which I think this story would would crumble somebody, you know, somebody um, that potentially has had the same experience in their life. So, you're, t you know, you get out of prison, you said you got married, then you got married again. Um, and as we go through life, I think it's rinse, rinse wash, repeat with you and your addiction and, mm -hmm. and the chaos it's caused. Did you go back to prison again? Hey, I've been to prison um, uh, three three times. Okay. Uh, well, four times all total. Yeah. Well, would, would, would I be, uh, would you be okay or would you have the liberty? If not, that's okay. But would you have the liberty to kind of speak on the loss that your life experienced? In prison? Yeah. Um, well, it definitely, you know, uh, as far as my family, my children and stuff, you know, I've, uh, I've not been able to raise any of my children. Yeah. You know, I've got, uh, six children. I've not been able to raise any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother and sister-in-law raised my two youngest kids. Um, uh, and, um, uh, I had a kid pass away. I had a child pass away in 1990. Um, that was the year I was born. Yeah. And, um. You know, and I just, uh, that was, that's the biggest thing to me today is, you know, I didn't see it then. I didn't see that. I, just like I said, my daddy made me feel, uh, uh, the situation in my home 
I just didn't feel important or or whatever, you know. I created that same thing just like you was talking about a while ago. I, I created that same environment in my own uh, my own life with my own kids and family. You know, I just run through them like a like a tornado, you know. And and but today, you know, I uh, I'm reaping the consequences of that. Absolutely. You know? And uh, and so um, I just didn't I didn't take the time. I didn't have the time. What I was wanting, to, I was selfish, you know, and I was just doing what I wanted to do, you know, and um, you know, and and that and it hurts, it does hurt, you know, and uh, but I just know that that God's going to work all that out today, and that's, you know, talking about contentment and uh, being at peace with everything, that's an area of my life where you know God has really uh, stepped in and made His presence uh very very known in my life today you know mm -hmm. uh you know uh, i'm just i'm not uh god says he's got me and, I, and that's what i trust in well i'm thankful god don't work the way the world does because yeah. if he mm -hmm. did you wouldn't have peace for a long time because yeah. you got a lot of mess yeah. to clean up yeah yeah my dad my dad he you know he he uh he got saved in 1982 and and uh and he spent uh the rest of his life to 2006 you know uh, trying to make up for things he had done wrong, you know, and he just, I mean, it was something he couldn't really do, you know. Uh, and he left this world with a guilty conscience and full of shame and stuff, and, and I'm just grateful today that, that I don't have to be, mm. I don't have to suffer that mm. and deal with that, you know. Because uh, Jesus did, mm -hmm. and you're just resting yeah. in his promises That's and good. his timeline. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's Mike. the thing That's about right. promises is, they are our promises, yeah. but his timeline ain't our timeline. Nope. So God affords us peace and joy and contentment, even in the journey of seeing mess. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to live in the guilt and the shame of what's created that mess. Yeah. I can live in the promises of what God's going to do in the mess. Yeah. I've just got to find ways to occupy truth in mm -hmm. these times so that I can keep peace yeah. and joy and not let that stuff define me anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's right. I mean, because yeah. there's nothing you could do about the past, mm -mm. There's not a thing you know, you but being about. released from that penalty and God moving in and giving you the liberty to overcome daily the power of sin to, to pack into the stream of life today yeah, mm -hmm. and live your life that way until you see him face to face. Mm -hmm. I mean, people don't remember the, you know, think about this. <clears throat> Babe Ruth, when you hit the most home runs, people talk about that to this day, but you know, the same mm. year he hit the most home runs, he had, he struck out the most. Mm. You mm. don't hear anybody talking about that. Mm. You know why? Because success always outweighs failure. Yeah. And so I could imagine just like Job 42, 12 says that God blessed the latter years of his life more than the former, mm -hmm. that as you fulfill what God's purpose is for your life from now until you go to heaven, mm -hmm. people are not going to be talking about your first 60 years. Yeah, They're going to be talking about the legacy you left in your yeah. last however many years you have on this, on mm -hmm. this earth. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what God does. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just a beautiful story of the fact that it's never too late. Never. Yeah. It's never That'll be too the title late. of this podcast. Yeah, it's never too late right. to surrender, abandon yourself to God, mm -hmm. let him get in your boat, yeah. and then let him start getting into your stuff. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, I had I had abandoned myself to the world. You know, really, I mean, just sitting in a, in a, a drug house, you know, just uh, with a needle in my arm, you know, just waiting on death, you know, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't suicidal or anything, but. You had nothing to live for in your own mind. Mm. You done tore everything up so much yeah. you couldn't live with yourself, so mm. you had to medicate. Yeah. And, Think uh, about that, dude. Yeah. A year later, you have no medication and you're content. Mm. Yeah. Right. There's no human power that can do that. <laughs> exactly right. Like your no, life sir. is a testimony of what the power of God can yeah. do when a man comes to the end of himself and asks God for help. Mm. That's pretty profound. Yeah. And I get to see it. Like, dude, this don't get old to me. And I don't no. ever want it to get familiar that there's a, there was a, this was a dead man. Yep. Mm. Walking. Yep. Right? Mm. Jesus come by his way. Mm. And for some reason, because of a moment of clarity, because of something that God afforded us to have, we didn't let that bypass us. Mm. And you took the life preserver. Yeah. And now look, man, a year later, God's probably done more than you could have ever thought of. Oh, yeah. 
He's done more in a year that you could have did for the rest of your life I trying to fix. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Sorry. <laughs> when I first when I first came here, you know, I was uh, I was confused. I was scared. I was mad. Uh, I was still defiant, you know, and and I was uh, I came here really, you know, uh, because uh, you know my wife, you know, she said you go or or you know there's no me and you, you know, and uh, and I spent the first couple of months or so here trying to figure out how I was gonna do these four months do the first four months and convince her that i was good you know mm -hmm. but the last couple of months you know uh uh i don't and i can't explain what happened in my my mind and my heart or anything you know but uh god just worked all that out you know cleared all that out of my mind and my heart and uh and by the time i got ready to uh commence and everything you know i i was you know i'd already settled it in my my mind my heart i was gonna stay you know mm -hmm. that, that, you know and uh and uh i didn't have to be uh talked into it or anything like that you know and uh and i think that's uh that's what that's the big that's the driving force for me today you know that that god just stepped in and mm. and uh, like you said done more in 60 seconds than i've done in 60 years you know mm -hmm. so, uh, well, I mean, it's not God's will for any should perish, and, you know, I love the fact that he continues to offer mercy so long as we're six feet above ground. Yep. And, you know, what you're speaking of is his relentless love mm -hmm. and grace and mercy yep. upon human race. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would just say to anybody listening to this story that uh, if you're listening and breathing, God ain't done. That's mm -hmm. right. And so if you hadn't opened your mouth lately and had a conversation with God, I yeah. mean, even if it's just help me, yeah, mm -hmm. you might want to consider reopening that communication with him. And mm -hmm. just like us, man, I believe he hears our prayers yep. and I believe he'll help us. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're a prime example of when a man gets to the end of himself and ask God for, ask God for help, but also equally willing to do whatever that help looks like. Mm -hmm. That a year later, your life is completely reconstructed, yeah. headed in a different direction. Um, and we believe that that ain't just something that he's favorable to f a few people. Mm. We believe that that's a gift that he's given the world. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I pray that this this message finds somebody yeah. that is in very desperate need of that gift that God has given us. Mm -hmm. And I pray that that finds them at a time where God gives them the faith to believe. Yeah. And to take that next step so that they're not setting this, they're not setting where they're at this time next year yep. looking the same. Yep. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And so that's why we do this, man, yep. because we want other people to find what God has so freely given us. Yes. Right. And I mean, why not take some time out of our day to give it mm -hmm. to somebody else? Right. Yeah. Well, Mike, dude, we love you, man. We thank you for spending some time with us, wow. coming and sharing uh, your story. Yep. Uh, we really know that it's going to benefit. It's going to help other people. Yeah. Because that's what God does. He mm -hmm. uses our pain to avert miser misery to other people. And yeah. I feel sure that he's going to do the same with this story. Mm -hmm. All right, man, for the humiliating part, yep. we always end with that leveling of the pride that we talk about. Yep. And in this case, it's going to be you shooting this jumper. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to find out whether or not you can shoot basketball as good as you know Southern rock and roll. Mm. All right, so you got three chances. Uh, you got to put the ball in that hoop. And if you can put the ball in the hoop, you can take home you some merchandise, okay? I don't have to catch no golf balls. Nope. Uh, so good luck. Got to be quicker than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. Are you okay. – Hold on, bro. You left-handed? Yeah. Hey, did you shoot ball in the <laughs> pen? I played handball a little bit. Did y'all have basketball courts? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let you play? I didn't play. I, I, didn't play. I mean, yeah, I don't know if we get... could talk about the kind of handball you played on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I mean, you, what, I mean, what you talking about? Handball, huh? you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. We know, yeah, we know. Yeah, Shoot yeah. that basketball. Yeah, off the wall. Oh, oh bless the Lord. Oh, All right, Father, yeah, Father, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> help direct this man's ball. Yes, sir. Yeah. Until next time. Shoot.